For those I've not met before, my name is Martin Lazell. I'm the vicar, senior pastor here, along with Emily. We lead the church together, and uh, it's brilliant to welcome you here uh, to St. Mark's, the start of this new term. But we are also today concluding uh, our series, Lessons in the Life of David, which we've been doing over the last few weeks. And today, I want to talk to you about the heart of of worship, and we're looking uh, at the chapter in 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 6, but I want to read particularly 2 Samuel 6, verses 12 to 15. So if you have a Bible, all the words are going to come up on the screen. Now King David was told, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. So I want to talk to you today about the heart of of worship. I don't think I'll ever forget this moment as being one of the most amazing worship sets that I have ever been a part of. It was hot, it was dusty, it was dirty, it was quite smelly. I think most of that was to do with me. It was quite hot. The floors and the walls of the building that we were in were just bare brick with a small cross at the front of the church. The worship team consisted of a, of a young guy playing, I don't know if any of you can remember, but the old Casio keyboards, playing piano on that, and the percussionist, if that's what she could be described as, or the drummer, she had an old iron that she was tapping with a stick. Pretty simple, pretty primitive, but the passion, the praise, the prayer, the authenticity, the singing, the dancing was absolutely amazing. And perhaps above all that, the sense of the presence of God was thick in that place. Emily and I had had the privilege to go to the Enanda Township in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa, which is about 45 minutes outside of Durban. And it's one of the poorest places, I think, that I've ever been to. But in terms of their worship, it was one of the richest. They knew in that place how to praise and to pray from a heart of worship. Today we're concluding this series, Lessons in the Life of David, and perhaps, or arguably, today's lesson is the most important lesson of all. It's a lesson that has the possibility of impacting our lives, the lives of us as a church, and impacting the world around us. The life of David teaches us so many things. But what it teaches us fundamentally is the importance of worship and prayer for us as Christians and having the right posture and passion towards the presence of God. I wonder what your highest aspiration is in life. I wonder what your greatest goal in life is. You see, for King David, above all of his other exploits, he loved God. As we read the Psalms, he says, As the deer pants for streams of living water, so my soul thirsts for you. He says, Oh God, my soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you. Your love is better than life. David was a worshiper first and foremost. He was passionate about the worship of God. He was passionate about the presence of God. And I think it was because of that that twice in Scripture he is described as a man after God's own heart. 
One writer says, we may marvel at his leadership abilities. We may delight in his poetic artistry. We may admire his military prowess. But David's love for God was his quintessential attribute, the sun around which all his other qualities revolved. I don't know about you, but I long for more of that in my own life. To love God and to be loved by God. I long for that for us as a church, as a community in this part of London, that we would be a church that's passionate, first and foremost, about encountering the presence of God. That we would know how to position ourselves in his presence. That we would be a church in this location that is seen as a church after God's own heart. The backdrop to this passage today, David has succeeded Saul as king of Israel, who are the chosen people of God. And whereas worship meant actually very little to Saul, David made it his ambition to put worship at the center of his reign, to have it as the foundation of his government. And that's why he was so interested in the Ark of the Covenant. He wanted the Ark of the Covenant to be in the city that he ruled over in Jerusalem. The Ark was central to Israel's worship. It housed the Ten Commandments above other things. And it wasn't just a symbol. It was the place where the presence of the, and the power of God resided on the earth. It was a demonstration of both God's imminence and his transcendence. The fact that God seeks to be close to his people, to be friends with his people. And yet he is other. He's holy. He's to be revered, to be honored. After being captured by the Philistines a number of years earlier, and uh, the Philistines kept the Ark of the Covenant uh, in their midst, which didn't necessarily go very well for them. There's a whole different story right there. But for 20 years, the Ark of the Covenant remained at the house of a priest called Abinadab in a place called kiriath Jerim. And now 20 years on, David is king. He's conquered Jerusalem. And as we read, David sets out to bring the Ark of God, the very presence, the very power of God into the city. But this wasn't the first time that David had tried to do that. The first time David had tried to bring the Ark of the Covenant into the city, it had ended in disaster. We read at the beginning of 2 Samuel 6 that David planned this huge production. He chooses 30,000 men to go with him to kiriath Jerim. He puts the ark on a brand new cart led by two trained oxen. And these oxen are two led by two men, the sons of Abinadab. A guy called Uzzah, which means strength, and a guy called Ahio, who means friendship. These were the sons of Abinadab. And everything we read seems to be going really, really well. There's a party atmosphere. They're celebrating. 2 Samuel 6, 5 says, David and the whole house of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with songs and with harps, lyres, tambourines, sistrums, and cymbals. For those of you that went last weekend, this is like David's tent on the Wissen estate on overdrive. This is a worship festival. But in the midst of their worshiping and their celebrating, disaster strikes. Verse 6 is when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. So Uzzah behind the ark as it is coming into the city of David. He sees the oxen stumble because they're coming to the threshing floor. Some people suggest that the oxen sees the grain and goes to eat something. And as the oxen sort of leans forward, the cart moves and the, the Ark of the Covenant is just about to fall off. And Uzzah 
perhaps we might think quite rightly, he reaches out his hand and he touches the ark. But what we read is that this is such an irreverent act. His sinfulness, his impurity comes into contact with the holiness and the purity of the presence of God. And although it seems shocking to us now, in that moment, Uzzah is struck dead. Can you imagine? Can you imagine thousands of people celebrating, partying, worshipping? And then there's this encounter with the holiness of God. And he dies. What had gone wrong? They thought they were doing the right thing. They thought they were worshipping in the right way. And we read that David, he's distraught, he's angry, he's fearful, he's discouraged, and he's anxious. And at that moment, he decides, instead of bringing the Ark of the Covenant into the center of the city, he puts it into the care of a priest called Obed-Edom, the Gittite. It's an unfortunate place to, you know, be from, being a Gittite. But anyway, we don't know much about him, but I mean, what a legend Can you imagine, there's King David, this whole gathering of people worshipping and celebrating. Can you imagine the fear that would have been instilled in that community around the holiness of God? And yet, Obed-Edom takes the Ark of the Covenant into his possession. And it says in verse 11 that the Ark of the Lord remains in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months And it says, the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Here I think we get another glimpse into why David is known as a man after God's own heart. Despite messing up, despite trying to do things his own way, despite his anger and his fear and his discouragement, David doesn't give up on God He doesn't give up on pursuing the presence of God. He doesn't give up on bringing the power of God into the city. But he takes time to reflect, repent, reset, and he inquires of the Lord. David's heart is to do God's plan, God's ways. Not in his own strength, but in God's strength. And if you're interested for uh, this story, we get a parallel passage that's running to give us more information on this. In 1 Chronicles 15, verses 11 to 15, it gives us this information. The reason as to why this happened was because they didn't inquire of the Lord. In verse 13 of 1 Chronicles 15, David says to the priests and the Levites, we did not inquire of the Lord how to carry it in the prescribed way. You see, because it was so holy, special requirements had been set and prescribed for the transporting of the ark for Moses. We read in Exodus 25. You see, the ark of the covenant was never meant to be on a cart pulled by oxen. It was meant to be carried by his people. The people of God are meant to carry the presence of God. But when it was captured by the Philistines, they set new regulations. It was almost like these new regulations for dealing with the presence of God were set by the world rather than by the people of God. So they decided to put the ark of the God, the the presence of God onto a new cart pulled by oxen. But David realizes the error of his ways. And this time, bringing the ark into the city, he follows the Lord's commands. He inquires of the Lord. He chooses prayer. He consecrates the Levites and the priests. They prepare themselves. And then he gets them to carry the ark of God. They're practical. And this time, for good measure, David doesn't want anything to happen like it happened before. So they decide to make a sacrifice every six steps of the journey. 
I have no idea how far Obed-Edom, the Gittite's house, is from Jerusalem. But even if it's a couple of miles, every six steps they sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. That journey would have been something extraordinary. It would have cost them so much. Financially, physically, and of course, in terms of time. Some people say that, uh, some commentators say that the reason the Philistines decided to put the Ark of the Covenant on a cart was because it was more efficient. It would speed up the process of transporting the Ark of the Covenant. But of course, we don't want to just try and find more efficient ways of worship. Worship is principally about sacrifice. And David adds his own moment of sacrifice. We read that he strips off, he goes down to his linen ephod, and he dances before the Lord with all of his might. Now, of course, today we know as the people of God, we don't have to sacrifice animals. That would be a very different affair as to what was happening tonight rather than communion in the way that we're going to be taking it later. It would be a little bit different. We know that we don't have to do that. Why? Because Jesus has died for us. His sacrifice on the cross once and for all has enabled us to have access into the very presence of God. It's through Jesus that we can go into the Holy of Holies. In the Old Testament, the high priest had to go into the Holy of Holies to make atonement at the Ark of the Covenant for the people. We know that our sins are forgiven because of what Jesus has done. So now we're invited to come as his people, not because we have to, but because we want to wholeheartedly. We don't come in worship through fear, but we come because of his love, his grace, and his mercy to bring our sacrifice, which is not animals, but it's us. Romans 12, 1, Paul says, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. He doesn't want the sacrifice of animals. He wants you. He wants me. He wants us on the altar, worshiping him, sacrificing to him, not every six steps, but every step of the way, every day of our lives, day in, day out, week in, week out, month by month, year by year, living sacrifices, inquiring of him, consecrating ourselves before him, being obedient to him. Not like us are trying to do the Christian life in our own strength. Not like a hey, just trying to be friendly Christians. See, often we can fall into the trap of thinking that worship is about something different than it is. Our worship is about him. It's not about a big production. It's not about efficiency. And sometimes in our worship, when we come, when we approach God, we can be tempted to be just familiar with God. They become too familiar with him. But what was required was obedience, was sacrifice. What does all of this mean for us individually and as a church in this place? I don't know how you're feeling I was chatting to Roland before this uh, service in the prayer meeting, and he was saying, the year starts in September. This is a new start for so many of us. It's like this reset moment, isn't it? The beginning of an academic year. And at the start of a new academic year, things can get very busy very quickly. Uh, I don't know whether you've had a chance to get away or be on holiday. For those of us who've had that privilege, suddenly you think, oh my goodness, the beach, the park, uh, that restful time, it, it, it's moved quickly. And many of us are moving into a new term, a new start at school, a new university place, a new season, sports or activities. It all kicks off. It can be pretty overwhelming, sometimes quite daunting. 
And then we think about the backdrop of what we're living in at the moment. COVID, history or not history, still with us, winter, economic crisis. We're carrying all of this. And yet into the midst of all of this, I think that God at this moment is inviting us into this reset moment to make the very presence of God our priority. At Focus. Who's at Focus? Anyone there? Yeah, amazing. We had over, well, I think it was about 185 people camping on our community pitch, uh, which was really exciting. On one of the days, there was a friend of ours who came and asked us a question, which was, if you could pray for one thing for the church, for St. Mark's, going into this new term, what would it be? And Emily and I thought for a while, and I think our response was, our prayer is that we would know and encounter the presence of God. That's the thing that makes all the difference. Jeremy Riddle, in his book, if you've not read it, I'd really recommend it, in uh, his book called The Reset, he says, this is what the world is starving for. This is what the church is starving for, places where they can encounter the real, true, liberating, redeeming, healing presence of God. Isn't that what we so desperately need, each one of us, individually, corporately as a church? That's why we're calling the church to pray for kingdom come. For no other reason, really, just to say, God, before we rush into our programs and what we think you might want to do, We want to inquire of you. We want to worship you. We want to consecrate ourselves before you. Consecrate yourselves because tomorrow he will do amazing things. Maybe today you've become a bit too familiar with God, maybe in your relationship. Maybe you need to find that place again of having a heart after God. Maybe you've become a bit inhibited in some way in your worship. Maybe you've got to that place where well, what would other people think if I sing up or raise my hands? I mean, David stripped off to his linen ephod and danced with all of his might. If you read later on in the story, his own wife, Michal, she despises him because of his passionate, exuberant worship. But he says, this wasn't for you or for anyone else. I did this for the audience of one. My worship is for him. Maybe we've been tempted at times to look at other people going for it, passionate in worship. And that's been hard for us for whatever reason. The pursuit of the presence of God is an invitation for a reset moment. He's called us to be carriers of his presence. We will never lead the world by imitating the world, but by choosing to position ourselves in his presence. This isn't just for us personally. We are in a spiritual battle, and we need to pray. In the Old Testament, the Levites, the priests, bless them, they were always put at the head of the army. I always feel a bit sorry for them, to be honest. Ben, the worship leaders, you know, who needs a machine gun when you've got a guitar? But the reason they did that was because they knew their greatest weapon was the presence of God. Zechariah prophesied, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. How on earth are we going to see lives changed? How on earth are we going to see people come to faith in Jesus if we don't know his presence? It's not going to be through more effective programs, better strategy, re-cranking the wheel on getting resources and stuff going. It's going to be the presence of Jesus that we carry. Moses' prayer was, God, if you don't go with us, then don't send us. And really, that's our prayer for here, God. If your presence doesn't go with us, don't send us. I believe he's calling each one of us back to the heart of worship, to re-find those places, those spaces, to pray, to consecrate ourselves, to read his word, to encounter him. 
to reset, to reorientate ourselves in his presence. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's pray, and then Bob's going to lead us in communion. Father, we pray that you would minister to us tonight, speak to us. Pray that we would sense and find you again. Would you lead and guide us in the power of your name? Amen.